All righty. Good morning, church. Oh, good, good morning, church. Wow, I'm blown away. I love it. Amen. So uh, in case you haven't noticed the absence of a tall man sitting around somewhere, um, the Moladekis are currently on vacation, and I know I miss them, but I think the Lord is going to do something cool today that we can report back to them. Amen. So um, as we get into worship, let's just, let's just hang out with Jesus for a second. Amen. So Lord, I thank you so much for what you're going to do today. Jesus, I thank you for who you are to us. I thank you for the fact that you transform who we are into something better, that you don't leave us as you, as you find us. Father, I pray that whatever we bring to you today, whether it's great joy or frustration or exhaustion, whatever it is, Lord, that we bring to you, Father, I pray that you would transform it, that you would make it into something pleasing and acceptable to you. Lord, we love you and we trust you. Thank you, Jesus. Why don't you stand with us? I search the world. I search the world. But it couldn't fill me. But it couldn't fill me. And we're going to sing a man's empty praise. Man's empty praise. And treasures that fade. Never and then you came along. And you came along. When you put me back together. And you put me back together. And every desire. Every desire. Now satisfied. Here in your love. Because of that we sing there is nothing. Oh, there's nothing. Better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Let's sing it again, oh, there's nothing. There's nothing. Nothing better than you. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, and I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Show you my weakness. The failure. Failures and flaws. But you know them all. You, you still call, call me friend. Because the God. He's the God of the mountain. He's the God of the valley. And there's not a place. And there's not a place where your mercy and grace won't find me again. There's nothing better than you, or oh, there's nothing better than you, or oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing, nothing, nothing. Oh, there's nothing better than you, or oh, there's nothing better than you, or oh, there's nothing. Better than you. Better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better. 
process. Who here knows that when they have tried on their own strength, they have failed miserably? I know I have failed. I know that when I try on my own strength, I end up being grumpy. I end up being annoyed with people, with myself. Why is this not better? And so our response then is actually counterintuitive. It's instead of taking control of our lives, it's surrendering control. And in scripture, we see this pattern played out over and over again. The Lord saying to Israel, if you give me control, I will take care of the rest. If you give me control, I will make sure it works out. I heard it once said, if it isn't good, it isn't the end. And so if it's not good yet for you, wait. Trust the process. Trust the story that God is good, that he loves you, and that he will take care of you through it all. And so we ask the Lord to do something. We see in scripture, we see the Holy Spirit being poured out, and uh, the imagery that's used sometimes is fire. That might sound interesting. What, why fire? Well, fire to wood or paper or cloth, that's going to burn it up. But fire to gold is going to purify it. And it's going to take out the, the, the junk, what's called the dross that's within us. It's going to bring it to the surface so it can be scraped away. When we surrender control, the Lord says, all right, let me purify now. Let me get you ready for what I have in store. So this next song is called Set a Fire, and we're just talking about set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. As in, Lord, would you pour your spirit out on me? Would you transform me from the inside out? I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain. And I can't control I want more of you, God I want more of you, God So set a fire down in my soul That I can't contain And I can't control I want more of you, God I want more of you, God So set a fire
So set a fire. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you. So set a fire. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you. I want more. 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 I want more.
transform our minds, transform our lives. Have your way, King Jesus. Have your way, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord, and it's in your name we pray. All God's people say, 
Amen. Amen. Why don't you turn and greet your neighbor? All righty, church. You're still stuck with me for just a couple minutes longer. Um, well, if you don't know my name, <laughs> I love you, Margie, so much. That's Yes, amen. Um, if you don't know my name, my name is Cameron. I'm the worship pastor here. Um, I am so grateful that I get to be a part of this wonderful congregation and worship with you every Sunday. Um, if you are new to joining us, whether new in person or new online, we just want to say we're so grateful you're here. We love you, um, and you are welcomed here. Um, if you would like to fill out a Connect card and turn that in downstairs, we have a little free gift that we'd love to bless you with. Um, and then we also, so those Connect cards are in the front of the seat, or in the back of the seat in front of you, um, as well as our prayer cards and our praise cards. Um, if you have any prayer requests, we pray over those as a church. We pray together, lifting up each other. And what's so cool is that we get to see miracles happen. Something happens when we pray that doesn't when we don't, uh, as I've heard it said. Don't quote me on that, quote someone else. <laughs> Um, if you also uh, want to fill out a prayer request or praise report online, you can do so through our U version, through the user version, our church app, um, or you can just talk to us one on one. Um, you can also give through U version, through the church app, or in person at the boxes at the back of the sanctuary. Um, before we do the rest of the announcements, let's just pray for our offering. Yes, dear Jesus, I thank you that you are our provider, that you are our source. Lord, I pray that. Um, you would show us how to trust in you with every aspect of our lives, through our finances, through our actions, through what we do for work, how we live our lives with our families, Jesus. Would you show us how to trust you with it all and just see your way of doing things? Lord, we trust you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we have just a few announcements. We have prayer in the park. Hale Park, Mondays at 7 p.m. We meet at the flagpole alongside other churches so that we can pray for our community. I think this is one of the most important things we do, praying together, uh, living out the John 17 prayer of being unified as one. Uh, across denominations, across different theological points of view, we can come together and pray and love our community. Amen? We also have midweek service at 7 p.m. just in the basement uh, in the kids' area. Um, what I'm excited about is I'm unfortunately not able to be there to hear her speak. However, one of my co-workers, the amazing Taylor Shelton, is going to be um, sharing about some missions trips she's been on uh, as well as uh, sharing on uh, Acts chapter 28. This is not something you'll want to miss. Um, Taylor is a missionary to the University of Illinois at Chicago. And uh, what I love about it is that, uh, man, she is a preacher. So you do not want to miss her because, man, she's going to bring the word. So uh, we also have men's Bible study Thursdays at 7. We have summer uh, hangouts that are going to be happening. Uh, you can fill out cards, talk to uh, Pastor Jen about that or Pastor JJ um, about our summer hangouts. We also have a, some summer outreach events. We have our Patriots Day Parade. If you would like to join us uh, in walking in the Patriots Day Parade, this is going to be a great time for us to love on the community um, uh, with Candy, I believe, is who's putting that together. That's what the note says, so it's right. Amen. Uh, we also uh, want to advertise for our VBS that's coming up. Um, VBS is an incredible time for our kids to get together, to have some fun, to worship, to do all of that. Or we have slides up? Great. Okay, I wasn't seeing them on the back. Um, so you can see Graciela uh, for more information about VBS. I highly recommend sign your kids up, or if you have friends or family nearby who uh, their kids might be interested, I try to sign them up. It's going to be a great time. So um, we also have a really cool event on August 12th. We've been talking about it for a while now. It's our Convoy of Hope uh, for Chicago event. Uh, it's going to be in Marquette Park on August 12th. The last one that we were a part of had around 12,000 people who not only had an opportunity to have prayer, uh, but also had wellness checks, dental, eye exams, 
haircuts, bags of food were given out. Uh, we are going to go bless the community. Amen? Amen. So then the last thing, if you want to register for serving with our uh, Hope, uh, Convoy of Hope Chicago events, you can uh, register to volunteer in the Version events, church app, or on the Hope Church website. Now, my favorite part is getting to embarrass my favorite preacher in the world. Um, and I don't just say that to get points. Uh, she hates when I say that. Amen. Uh, so uh, what I'm so excited about is hearing from Pastor Allie. Uh, she has served as a youth pastor for four years before joining Chi Alpha staff. So would you give her a warm welcome? Also, she's my wife. I love that that's the afterthought. And so, by the way, we're married. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, this might get a bit interesting, and it's not because I'm unprepared. It's because I had every intention of drinking from my water bottle this morning, and then someone handed me cold brew. So we might be done in 20 minutes. Uh, <laughs> this might go real quick. Uh, but I am, uh, as you said, if we haven't had the opportunity to meet, my name is Allie. Uh, I absolutely love being here with you guys at our my home church of Hope Midway. Uh, even though my job is not as a pastor on staff, but instead a missionary uh, to Northwestern University. That is where I spend my time. Uh, and that makes this message incredibly personal to me. It is my heart and it is my passion. That's your preview for the day. Uh, but also it's incredibly personal because uh, every time I read the passage that we're going to be based out of today, I think a little bit of my hometown. Believe it or not, I did not grow up in Chicago. We moved here about five years ago. Uh, I grew up in southern Illinois in a very tiny town called Litchfield. You will not have heard of it. Don't feel bad. It's, <laughs> Tobin's heard of it. He's nodding his head. That's incredible. Thank you, Tobin. Wow. Uh, one fan. Uh, <laughs> it's like the comedians who go up and they're like, no one's heard of this. And there's one woo in the crowd. Uh, but small town. And I feel like when I bring up that I grew up in the country, Chicago natives don't really understand what I'm talking about. Because they're like, okay, so like Chicago, but smaller, and there's animals, right? No. <laughs> I feel like we need to explain a little bit uh, how, how country my hometown was. <clears throat> so my hometown was so country <laughs> that uh, we had cornfields right across the street from our high school. I see the shock. Just don't worry, we're just getting rolling. <laughs> My hometown was so country, uh, the largest club in our high school was our Future Farmers of America. It was so large, they had their own spirit week. Mm -hmm. My hometown was so country, we had drive your tractor to school day. And they did. Uh, my hometown was so country, the majority of the traffic lights weren't even in town. They were by the highway, and you had to drive to get to them. My hometown was so country, our population counted the people that were in the farms a few miles out because we wanted those few people so we could say we had 6,000. That was my experience growing up. Uh, for any of you, if you've gone to camp, with either the kids or the teens, you have seen basically what my hometown was like. That is half an hour away from my hometown. So the cornfields, just imagine that, just a little bit further away. <laughs> uh, but I think of that because of this passage in Luke 10 that we'll be reading today. In this, we see that Jesus, in the course of his ministry, is now sending out his followers, and not just the 12, but what we call the 72, a core group of people that followed him throughout the course of his ministry. So starting in verse 1, it says, The Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. They, these were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his fields. Now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. For the next 13 verses, Jesus then begins to instruct his followers in incredible detail about how to address the people in these communities based on what their culture would dictate. As he is talking to them, he is giving them ideas of how they should handle 
this news that they are going out and doing, how they should approach people, how should they should handle rejection in all of this. But then we have him wrapping up in verse 16. And he says, Then he said to the disciples, Anyone who accepts your message is also accepting me. And anyone who rejects you is rejecting me. And anyone who rejects me is rejecting God who sent me. When the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Yes, he told them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you all authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. But don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. I want to take a look at this and break it down and talk about the calling up of the disciples in this passage. Because amazing things happen, but we also see the disciples learning in this process. And we know, if you look at the chapter before this, that it's not the first time Jesus has done this. He has spent the past chapter slowly calling up and challenging the disciples to more and more leadership. First, he sent out the twelve to go and do ministry. And they came back and reported incredible things. Then when he had the 5,000 that needed to be fed, and they said, uh, Jesus, how are we going to feed these people? His response, you feed them. This isn't the first time Jesus has called them into some kind of leadership, but we see here the amping up of it, that continuing to stretch them out of their comfort zone. And so why is this important for us? Well, it's what Jesus thought was important for his followers to know. And if you weren't aware, as the church, we are followers of Jesus. So this applies to us too, not just to them. The first thing we notice is that the disciples were sent to prepare the way. Jesus in human form couldn't be everywhere at once. While we believe God can be, Jesus, as a man, had to stick to one place at a time. And we know that he was aware his time was short. So how does he make sure that he can see as many people, heal as many people, reach as many people as possible in the time that he has left? He sends his people out ahead of him to let them know he is coming, to prepare the way for him. This isn't new. It was something that Old Testament prophets would do when talking about the Lord. It's something that they would have even in the Roman Empire during the time of Jesus. Heralds would be sent ahead of armies, of officials, and they would tell cities, you need to get ready because someone's coming and you need to be there. That's what these people were doing. And even now, we do something similar. We just um, do it with our phones. We use social media. We make announcements with PowerPoints (laughs) to let people know that things are going to happen. We might do it with technology. They did it physically. And what they were doing was going to these towns that Jesus was planning on going to and saying, we are able to do the things that we're doing, the miracles that we are doing with you because of our rabbi Jesus. You need to come hear him teach. All are welcome. That was what they were doing. They were going out and saying, oh, if you think this is good, wait till you meet our rabbi. He's coming, and you'll want to hear him. They were the heralds of the good news, drawing people so they could come to the source. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with farming and what a harvest looks like, uh, but you can't just drop some seed and then walk away, and then it grows. That's not how it works. You have to prepare a field. So what farmers will do, even in the off-season, as they are preparing their field, is they will go out and till the soil, sometimes taking these huge machines and going out and tilling the soil, loosening up the ground and digging these rows for the seed to eventually go into. And sometimes, if the soil isn't good, if they've tested it and the pH is off or there aren't the right nutrients, they will then have to put compost or fertilizer or other things in it to prepare the soil for the seed that they're going to plant and the harvest that they want. They can't just plant the seed and expect it to work. They have to put in preparation for what they eventually want to happen. This is what the disciples were doing. 
metaphorically preparing soil for what was going to come to each of those towns. The next thing we see is that the disciples were sent together. There were 72 of them, and they were sent in pairs. If you don't want to do the math, that's 36 pairs. You're welcome, Courtney. No one wants to do math on a Sunday morning. No. Especially during the summer. I've got all of you. It's all good. I used a calculator and did it myself. But that's 36 different locations, and realistically, they could have done more. There were 72 of them. They could have gone to 72 communities. So why in pairs? Why was it important? Because not only did it limit them, but it's also important enough to be mentioned in the scripture. Well, because they needed each other. When you are farming, you do not do the work alone, especially nowadays where farms are no longer one to five acres, but up to hundreds of acres that you are responsible for. You need not just the person who owns the land, but farmhands and sometimes your neighbors. Uh, there were people in my hometown where there were kids that would miss school to help work every once in a while because they needed the hands. What we are doing and what they do is not possible by yourself. When farmers are preparing and they do the work, they need someone to help them if they are not able to do it in the certain amount of time. There's a narrow window that they have. Harvest itself, depending on the weather, can only be a couple weeks. And if you've only got a couple weeks, you need all hands on deck. But also sometimes you need someone to check you when you're thinking and you miss something, because we're all human, we make mistakes. So if you miss a row, if you go the wrong direction, <laughs> if you maybe don't turn on the machine the right way, we've all been there, you need someone to check you. You also need someone that you can bounce ideas off of and problem solve with. These were what the pairs were meant to do, not only going together and supporting each other, but helping each other do what they were supposed to do. In Ecclesiastes 4, Solomon wrote, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. We were meant to do things together. More people is better for doing things. As anyone who's volunteered in a church event will know, more hands equal better. It's helpful. But beyond that, we know that people were created for community. Beyond that, I'll take it a step further, that a God who exists in community created us for community. In the beginning of the Bible, the beginning of the story of humanity, God acknowledges it is not good for man to be alone. Right off the bat. And that hasn't changed you can look up study after study of psychologists telling you about the importance of community to people's mental health. The negative effects that things like solitary have on a human mind. Now you can go and look at case studies that have been done about the effects of the pandemic and quarantine that have happened. We need community. It is an innate need of ours in every aspect of our lives which includes what God calls us to do. He has made each of us unique, but that doesn't mean we have to stand alone. Paul calls us a body of Christ where these unique pieces mesh together to form a working system. So these disciples, I guarantee seven, all 72 of them were not the same. We know about 12 of them, and they were very different. And yet they worked together and we see something amazing come out of it. Another thing we see is that the disciples were warned about problems. Jesus was honest with them, and he said he was sending them out like lambs among wolves. 
He also said, anyone who rejects you is rejecting me. There wasn't an if in that statement. It wasn't, you know what, they might not like you. It's a, it'll probably happen. And when it does, here's what it means. Here's what you need to keep in mind. As they go forward, understanding you will face problems. It was not guaranteed to be easy, even though he was sending them out to do something for God. Sometimes I think we expect what God calls us to do to be easy because God said so. It doesn't mean it's easy, it means it's possible. When farmers are planting and going through the harvest season, there are so many things that can go wrong. Having a healthy crop is dependent on so many different factors. All it takes is one cold snap to ruin your entire crop for the year. Modern farming has worked incredibly hard on creating all of these different products that can help combat things, and it's still a gamble. They can have fertilizers, they can have pesticides, they can have weed killer, they have found organic ways to do this. There's irrigation systems, there's machines that help them work more quickly, and they can problem solve, but it is never easy. And there's never a downtime. They are constantly planning and working through challenges that they are encountering. But rarely do they say, this isn't worth it, and I'm just not going to do it anymore. In these different seasons where they are doing different work and they are trying to overcome different obstacles, they keep working. They know it's not easy, and yet they choose to do it. We see this isn't the only time that Jesus talks about rejection. He's very comfortable with it. Jesus himself experienced rejection multiple times. Their story in the gospel of him preaching and the people disliked it so much, pretty much everyone but the 12 left. And he turned to them and he said, are you going to leave too? We serve a God who is not unaware of rejection and hardship. He just makes us aware of it and promises to be with us through it. He provides us answers of how to deal with it. A chapter before this story in Luke, Jesus sends out the 12 and he tells them, if you encounter rejection from the community, wipe the dirt off your feet and walk away. It's going to happen. Let it go. If you want to go back to like old school Taylor Swift, you can shake it off. but shake the dust off your feet and walk away. We were not promised for it to be easy, but we were promised that we will be victorious. In verse 15, as Jesus is talking to them, he says, look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. And we are able to say that because it's about him, not us. Because we make mistakes. We are not perfect. We are not all-knowing. We are not all-powerful. But he is. We are able to be lambs amongst wolves because Psalms 23 tells us that he is our shepherd. We are able to go and face rejection because it's not rejecting us, it's rejecting him. Jesus himself said in John 16, 33, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. When we face hardships, he says, don't worry, I've got it. When he sent out the 72, he said, no, there will be struggles, don't worry, I've got it. And we saw that it was true because the disciples saw results. They came back so excited about all of the miracles they had seen, and they said, even the demons listen to us when we use your name. Now, we might be like, okay, calm down, because we know the story. We've read it a few times. Uh, But imagine, if you will, put yourself in the shoes of the disciples. You've been sent out to go tell people things. 
and even demons listen to what you have to say when you use the name of Jesus. You would probably also be pretty darn excited, right? There's an excitement in that, this power, this experience, the miraculous that you are encountering. And yet we see Jesus not brush it off, but shift their perspective. He's going, yeah, why are you surprised by that? You see me do it all the time. Like chapter four, he's like, hey, do you remember like the 5,000 that we just fed miraculously? Do you remember that? Yeah. This isn't new. Where he instead is talking about the people. He, was, he promised that his followers would continue to see the miraculous. But that was not the reason that he came. In John 14, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my Father's name and I will do it. The miracles are not the sticking point. He says, yeah, those will happen. But here's what's really the focus. The miracles are a blessing that point us back to our loving Heavenly Father who provides them. They're not the goal. It flows out of our closeness and in a relationship with God, not us doing the right things and plugging in the right equation so that we get power. These are tools given to help us do the work, not the work itself. We see here, Jesus sent them out not to perform miracles, but to prepare the way, to let them know what was to come. And any time Jesus performed miracles, it was never just for the miracle's sake, but instead to point them to God and to talk about the kingdom of heaven. There was a worship that came from it. So just like we see with crops, where there are tools that are used to make them grow, we acknowledge that during this time the miracles are not the crop. The miracles are the fertilizer and the insecticide and the water and the machines. The crop is the people who come to know a loving Jesus who died for them. That is the crop that he talks about. So why do I bring this up? It's a really cool thing to observe and to break down in scripture and be like, ooh, Jesus did a thing. But why does it matter to us 2,000 years later? Because at the end of his earthly ministry, Jesus gave us something called the Great Commission. Where he said, go into all the world and make disciples. Teaching them all that I have taught you. The church was not this one group of 72 that went out and did a cool thing, and now we're done. Jesus said, this is what you are going to do from now on. I've sent you out, and I've sent you in power, and I've had you do this while I'm here, so you know what to do once I'm gone. You can teach others what to do once I'm gone. We are also called to go out. We are called to be the new heralds of Jesus' good news, pointing the way to the source. That we go out and we live our lives so that we are saying with everything that we do, here is who Jesus is and what he's done for you. He loves you. Maybe that's your words. Maybe that's just how you treat people. Maybe it's how you respond to the hard times that you will encounter. But we are called to be those heralds of a good news, even if Jesus is not physically coming right after you. We are meant to go beyond the comfort of the church walls and be out in the world making disciples. 
We also need each other. We are meant to work together as that body of Christ. Each of us have been given a multitude of talents that others in the church body might not have. Uh, I can't play piano or guitar or drums like Cameron and Tobin and Vanessa did this morning. Not everybody feels super comfortable standing up here with a microphone in their hand. Newsflash, I don't either. <laughs> Not everybody is gifted and passionate about working with the kids, but it's incredibly important. We are all meant to go. Not a single Christian was meant to be an idle consumer. We were all meant to be workers in the harvest before us. On the farm in harvest time, everybody works. I'm, a, I'm not joking when I say that in middle school, I would have classmates of mine that would miss school for entire days because they needed to go out. It didn't matter that they were kids. They had a part to play in their family business. Now, did their family acknowledge what their capacity and responsibilities were? Absolutely. But they were a part of the family, so they worked with the family. We also know that it will be hard, whatever we are doing. But we are promised victory. And there are different kinds of hard. Sometimes there's just a lot going on and the stress of everything just weighs on you. And the idea of being positive and optimistic and talking about the goodness of God seems like the hardest thing you could possibly do. Sometimes the relationships in your life are so rough, it's hard to believe that there is a relational God that is good. Sometimes work and finances are so stressful, it's hard to think about contributing financially to the mission of God because what if I need it? There is hardship of all kinds. We live in a broken world, and brokenness leads to brokenness. Whether it's hurt, or poverty, or war, or poor health, or broken relationships, all of those exist because of our broken world. But then on top of that, when we say yes to what God has for us, we have an enemy actively trying to stop us. We not only encounter the natural obstacles that just come with life, but we have an enemy who wants to use them to destroy us. But we know from the word that Jesus says, I have overcome. That through his death and resurrection, there is nothing more powerful than him. So even when things are hard, there is that victory. Like Cameron talked about before, if it's not good, it's not done. We see in Revelation a promise of what that victory looks like. Where it is, despite the worst of the worst that is laid out in the book of Revelation before it, we see God victorious. And in these times when we, it is hard, we support each other. Sometimes that is the need that we have, why we need community. And because of all of this, if we are willing to follow him and be a worker, we will see results. If you don't hear the testimonies of the people here in this church, I beg you, go ask somebody. Because we have stories of what God has done of the goodness that he has shown us, the blessings that he has poured out. We have seen the results of what God is able to do through his people. There are stories upon stories. We could fill an entire service just with that. And who knows, maybe some week we will. We have seen what God is capable of doing in the Bible and now. 
And the probably most comforting thing to me personally is that we're not responsible for the crop, just the handling of the harvest. God is the only one who can call people to himself. But are we opening a door? Are we willing to till the soil and put down the fertilizer and weed out the bad and then help people when they have the questions? Are we willing to be the harvest workers for the God who ultimately grows the crop? Jesus himself told the disciples as they were going out how they should pray. He said, so pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into the field. There was a harvest to be had 2,000 years ago when Jesus came and walked this earth. And there is a harvest to be had now. And we are still in need of workers. I bet as I say that and I talk about people needing to know Jesus, people pop into your mind. Whether it's friends, family, coworkers. There are people that come to mind where they don't know what it means to have a loving relationship with Jesus. And how will they know if no one goes and tells them? So this is what I want our challenge to be today. If Cameron wouldn't mind coming up real quick. I get to pick on him now. If each of us as Christians is called to be a harvest worker, then we have to answer that call. A farmer when it's harvest season has to choose to set that alarm for 5 a.m and then choose to get out of bed and go to the fields. So in this time, as we go and end this time of prayer, are you willing to set that alarm yourself? To go into the fields to do work? And how I want us to do that in this setting together as a church is to come forward. To come forward and make that commitment before God and our community to put in that work. And then we will spend time asking God what our job in that is. For some, it might be a specific coworker that God puts on your heart to step out of your comfort zone and befriend them and love them with God's love. To share even if they don't receive it. For some of us, it might be stepping into a volunteer position here at the church and serving the body. For others, it might be financial giving because you're able to, to support those who can't. Whatever it is, I know for a fact God has something for you. And if you're willing to figure out what that job is and step out into it, I would like to invite you to, enjoy, to join me here at the front.
Father God, we thank you for the hearts of those willing to answer a call for harvest work. We thank you that you prepare us ahead of time for this work and empower us to do it. God, I ask that as we look at what might possibly be ahead of us, you would make the path clear. As the psalm says, you are the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. May you, God, reveal what is next as they step forward into this work of harvest. God, we ask that you would make the harvest itself apparent as they look up to it. I ask that you would make it clear outside of these church walls the heart that you have for people. God, give us your perspective of the people that we encounter. May you equip and embolden us to do the work that you have called us to. And even in the hardships, may you remind us of your promise of victory because you have overcome. God, I ask that your blessing would go before people and we would be able to return to our community together, being able to tell the stories of even the demons listening when we call upon your name that we would have story after story of your goodness and seeing you bring people to yourself as we are faithful to do the work. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Thank you all so much for coming. It is no longer raining as it was overnight, so please go out and enjoy your amazing Sunday. God bless.